Paul Harvey was a radio personality. He had a broadcast called The Rest of the Story. He would tell the audience of little-known details of stories that we may or may not have heard about. This episode is an homage to him. In the video, Browning's Other World War II Handgun, I submitted that the P-35 has been forgotten. Many of the comments pointed out my glaring omission of certain details. I will write that wrong at the end of this video. The comments from the first video inspired me to make this one. Thank you for the motivation. I learned a lot and had some of my misconceptions corrected. The Browning P-35 High Power, also known as the Grand Puissance, is a legendary semi-automatic pistol that has undergone significant evolution over the years. However, this gun story begins years before its concept ever touched paper. John Moses Browning A creator and innovator whose name is associated with many of the most iconic firearms in modern history. John's string of successful upgrades to lever-action rifles, including the Model 1895, the first commercially successful use of a fixed-box magazine, cemented his celebrity. Enter a Belgian arms factory, Fabrique Nationale des Armes de Guerre, formed to answer the Belgian government's desire to replace 150,000 military rifles in 1887. The facility was located in Herstal, Belgium, a suburb of Liege. Natural resources, coal, iron, and water are plentiful, ideal for arms building. FN built a state-of-the-art factory. In five years, 150,000 Mauser rifles were delivered to the Belgian government at 79 francs each. Orders for arms and ammunition soon followed. In 1894, Waffen Fabric Mauser sued FN for patent infringement of their Spanish Mauser model. Among other penalties, Ludwig Lowe and Company became the majority stakeholder of FN arms and ammunition. Orders were getting moved from Liege to German facilities. Other products were considered to keep the facility alive. One option, bicycles, required research. FN sent Hart O. Berg to America to learn what he could about bicycle manufacturing. Berg was from Hartford, Connecticut. He started there. Colt also had a factory in Hartford. Somehow Berg connected with Browning on one of his visits to Colt. Berg was able to tell John about a state-of-the-art factory complete with gunsmiths and artisans that is reduced to building bicycles. This facility desperately needs an in-house designer and blueprints for the next generation of firearms. It so happened that John M. Browning wanted a situation where his products could be manufactured and tested quickly. Some of his patents were bought so that no one else could get them. Several of his ideas never materialized, especially when the sale included royalties. The Americans shut John out of royalties. The item would not be made, no sale, no royalty. Berg returned to Belgium in June of 1897 with a prototype of a small 32 ACP 7.65 by 17 millimeter caliber automatic pistol, the future FN Browning model 1899, the factory's first handgun. The first royalty John ever collected came from FN. The M1899 had become popular. The fee was $2,000 plus 2 francs per unit. The M1899 sold 10,900 units. The M1900, an upgraded 1899, had a production of 724,550, a 1,470,900 franc bonanza. In 1902, that is $283,883.70 in U.S. currency. The thing that sealed the deal for FN revolves around a shotgun. John had his automatic shotgun, the Auto 5. Winchester sat on this product for over three years with no sign of ever developing it. John was going to try with Remington, but that meeting did not happen. The president of the company died of a heart attack within minutes of the appointment. 
John crossed the pond to work with FN. FN reviewed the Auto 5. They saw the value that Winchester seemed to have missed. John's first commercial auto-loading design is going to finally see the light of day. Within a month, three events became one. FN established a payment structure for the royalties of the shotgun they were about to build. FN got the worldwide manufacturing and distribution rights for the Auto 5. The first 10,000 shotguns were sold to John Moses Browning for the American market. I know someone watching this will be asking, what about the Remington Model 11? If that person is you, congratulations. I had to research this history to find out this bit of trivia. This was a one-time concession made to the man that FN and the community of Airstall called the Master and only involved the Auto 5. Big Green sold around 840,000 of these shotguns including a World War II contract to the military. Yet another Browning tool in the hands of our valiant warriors. In 1907, John Moses Browning granted FN exclusive rights to use his name as a trademark. Even though FN had exclusive rights to Browning's trademark, there are several examples of them allowing John to negotiate outside of the partnership. For example, the M1911. FN had to wait until the patent expired to build any. The sheer numbers of World War I effort required multiple manufacturers to build small arms and machine guns. World War II even more so. In 1922, the French military established new requirements for a service pistol, seeking a replacement for the revolver model in 1892, which had served them since the late 19th century. Here are some key points about these requirements. Several manufacturers, including Browning, Colt, SACM, and Petter, submitted entries to the competition. I don't think anyone knew in 1922 that the French trials would run into 1935 before they made a selection, least of all John Browning. John's prototypes were in the shadow of Colt's 1911 patents. Color me surprised to learn that the original prototype was striker fired with a 16 round double stack magazine. As many of you know, John passed away in 1926. Did you know that he was at his desk until he was too weak to continue? The master had been on the factory floor of FN Hairstall when the chest pain started. His son Val was with him. A fitting end for a legend. Surrounded by his creations, a symbiotic workforce, and an entire community that mourned his death. The prototype was the only striker fired pistol design Browning ever created. I was unable to find any iterations from the first prototype to John's death in 1926. John's legacy was carried forward by one of his colleagues at FN, Diodon Saiva. Saiva took up the mantle and finished what John Browning had started, resulting in the completion of the high power. Following the expiration of the patents related to the 1911 in 1928, Monsieur Saiva incorporated some of those design features into the new pistol. Despite French testing delays, the high power gradually took shape. By 1935, the mostly final design was established just in time for the French to opt for a different pistol model. Herein lies a discrepancy in research results. My AI source tells me that by 1934 the pistol was complete and named the High Power or GP35 in Belgium due to its high magazine capacity for the time 13 rounds. Fortunately FN's reason for existing the Belgian Army 
saw the potential in the high power. They purchased an initial batch of 1,000 pistols for trials, which they were well received. In 1935, the high power officially became the standard sidearm for the Belgian military. Either way, the French got their carbine caliber pistol. The SACM Petter design, also known as the PA 1935, emerged victorious and became the new French service pistol in 1935. It fulfilled many of the established requirements, offering a reliable semi-automatic design chambered for the 8 by 27 millimeter Lebel cartridge. This weapon served the French military for several decades. In case you're wondering, FN really did build the chainless bicycle. It even got the Browning brand. This is where my report ends on the origin of this magnificent little gun. There is a rich and full history that follows here. As promised, I will explain myself when I use the word forgotten. Perhaps I should have said disinterested. For example, the following three people were legendary in American cinema. Have you forgotten Elizabeth Taylor, Shirley Temple, Randolph Scott. Randolph Scott. Randolph Scott. Well, this material might be a little bit dated for some of this audience. I hope you get my point. Out of sight is out of mind. I reached past both of my high powers to get my 1911 carry gun. I was guilty of overlooking them. They got some long overdue TLC as a result of the first episode. I don't know about others, but when I go to the range, polymer pistols appear to be the most prevalent. Steel guns tend to be 1911s. On my next trip to the range, I'm taking one of the girls with me to see if she gets any attention. The demand for the high power was so low that in early 2018, FN discontinued production. In 2022, the gun they developed was familiar, but not interchangeable with the original. The reception was mixed. Springfield Armory developed the SA-35, which allows the P-35 magazines and the grips to be used in each of the firearms. To those that still carry the high power, I commend you. I trusted my life to one while I wore a badge, until the sheriff decided that uniformed deputies would carry the Smith & Wesson Model 686 for being able to share ammo and speed loaders if needed. So I switched to the revolver. The 1911 has a strong following. The P-35 is less visible. During World War II, the high power outnumbered the 1911 in the number of soldiers carrying it. From the results of the comments to the first video, the high power is alive and well. I stand corrected. To quote Mr. Harvey, now you know the rest of the story.